You feel like you're in space? Oh, because of the headset? Yeah. Have you been to space? I want space out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, this is KO. We are recording for Ajima.com. And I'm here today with Jeffrey Ko of Flap Slab. Uh, Ajima is our website, Instagram, where we discuss subcultures. Honeycomb Arts is a division of Honeycomb and we produce public art. But we also came to a point where we were doing a lot less. And less um, is more. Yeah, you know, because we were working on the new studio, so we weren't able to do so much uh, yeah. public work. And I thought, well, we still really love this community and the scene, so let's start covering it. So it started with that. We were covering uh, toys. Actually, no, we were covering street art and street. graffiti. Yeah. And then while we were doing that, we saw lots of the ways that the cultures were overlapping. We wanted to do coverage of toys. We wanted to do coverage of streetwear. We actually also wanted to do coverage of fine art. You know, I always say it's the big boy effect, like how all of it is coming together into one. Yes. So we decided to set up Ajima. It, I actually just made up the word. Does it mean and anything? It, it doesn't mean anything. And then I just thought, ah, oh, this sounds like a nice word. And we're going to be able to register it on Ajima.com because nobody is, uses the word. I tried uh, Googling it, but to see whether it means anything Japanese. <laughs> and then, but it sounds Japanese. That's yeah. a, that's one thing. And uh, so psychologically, people have feelings about it immediately. Uh, but later on, I decided to make it adjective image. Okay. So we are describing images, and it's kind of tongue in cheek because you know, it, if a picture is worth a thousand words, you shouldn't have to say anything. But yet here we are talking about it all the time. Okay. Right? Kind of ironic. <laughs> a little bit ironic. So that's that's where we are today. And I thought it would be nice um, to sit down and talk with you about this, since this seems to be very much your thing as well. So why don't you tell us a bit about, let's start with Flab Slab. What is Flab Slab? It's an acronym for Float La Butterfly Sting La Bee. Oh. It's quite a mouthful. We have been called Fab Slab, Slap Flap, whatever, I think. But it's actually an acronym made famous by a certain boxer yeah. yeah why Why do you say a certain boxer certain boxer so that, that line was actually I think kind of um, invented by his trainer okay yeah but it kind of um, embodies what Muhammad Ali was or is and uh, in a way I think it's also what we are trying to do as an agency I think whatever that I think drives the stuff that we do as well so just a bit of background, I started my own creative agency back in uh, 2001, mm -hmm. almost 20 years ago, doing corporate shit. Yeah, okay. stuff that pays the bills. Yeah. That much everyone has to be very realistic about. So, but as with all corporate jobs, after a while, you just get uh, brain dead. You start whining about clients. Yeah. Colleagues start bitching about each other. It's just tiring. So mm -hmm. about um, eight, nine years ago, I figured, okay, I'm getting old in age. And this cannot carry on. Mm. So I've always been interested in art, toys, street culture. So I said, heck it, I'm still going to do my corporate job, but um, I'll do something for myself. That's why zero fucks given. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have no clients. As long as we don't lose our, our pens doing the stuff that we want, we will do it. Wait, what do you mean by you have no clients? No clients under Flap Slap. So when I started, I think everyone was asking, oh, are you guys a toy company? I said, yeah, we make toys, but... That's not what we do. We have organized pop-up dinners. We have held art exhibitions. We have, uh, I think, even created dinners. So it's just, I think, a little playground for us to do whatever that we want without, uh, I think, a client brief and uh, as a distraction from day-to-day -day work. What do you mean by curated dinners? So what happens in a curated dinner? Okay, I think maybe about seven, eight years ago, we had a chance to take over a shop house at, uh, in Geelang. Mm -hmm. You know, Geelang is, is famous for their food and other night activities. But, um, a little I think bit it was seedy, a little bit grimy. And very grungy as well. Grungy, yeah. yeah it's, um, I think we had the good fortune of uh, taking over a shop house that's about three and a half or four story. Yeah. Oh, wow, big. Yes, it was a um, totally refurbished, lovely shop house. What street was it on? Lorong 24A. Okay. Yeah, so it's the street where it's all clean with the clan associations with the medical halls. We had, um, I think, the chance to take over 
the shop house for a weekend. Mm-hmm. So now that a couple of friends have said, let's do something crazy and throw a party. Okay. So we put the team together, took over the shop house, sold dinner tickets from 7 to 10 o'clock and then uh, bar tickets from 10 till late. Okay. So it was basically kind of like a curated uh, private party. So we got in our private chefs, we got in DJs, we used our art and our toys as uh, decoration. So everything was marketed through word of mouth and uh, online. And we sold out the tickets. So you sold tickets? Yeah. Okay. So it's paid for. Because we, we had to earn some money to cover the cost of... Uh, of yeah. course. So we had uh, a client who was kind enough to sponsor alcohol as well. How many people? Like- so throughout the night, I think we had about three to 400 people. Okay. And the police came knocking on our doors. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, you need a permit in Singapore for that? Well, it's, a, of... it's a private party. Oh, yeah. okay. So the police came, took my IC, took down my details. I said, sir, we are just running a private party. I mm-hmm. said, okay, not too much noise. So we shut the doors, went up, and continue having fun. Okay. Yeah. So I, I see this as, I think, a distraction from the day-to-day work that we do and just basically crazy ideas. Everyone says that Singapore is boring, but I think if you dig deeper and if you try harder, it's not as boring as it seems. Yeah. Yeah, I've started to notice that. I've been spending a lot more time here in Singapore. And when you can, when you find the subcultures and find people who are very passionate about, you know, what they're working yep. on, uh, there are people here who are doing things that no one else is yep. really doing at that level, whether it be risograph yep. or toys, right? <laughs> where we are today. I think we just need to know the right people, know where to dig, where to go. I think... Almost every day, there's something going on. And mm. especially during Fridays and weekends, I think you just don't have enough time to do the things that you want. Yeah. So really, I think I always say boredom is a state of mind. So if you're bored, wherever you go, you'll be bored. So you started Flap Slab and you started doing these kind of one-offs, pop-ups. Yeah, pop-ups, um, working with artists. And naturally, I think we became known for creating toys because I think especially when people come to the studio and they see toys over. I say, yeah, we are, we are a toy maker. We have produced toys, but I think I would like to think that we are beyond that. Because producing toys is easy. I think it's the whole aspect of marketing, selling, engaging people. That's really the challenge. Yeah. And also knowing what toys to make. I think that's a big part of it as well. In a way, I'm very bad at that because we are still going based on my gut feeling of I think what we want to do yeah, versus I think what the market demands. I mean, it's always easy to veer towards, I think, what you think the market wants and try to make stuff. But I think, lo and behold, that will never last because you'll forever be chasing hype and chasing the game. So I'd rather spend our own money, make the stuff that we want and be happy doing what we want. And if we find an audience, I think that's a bonus. Okay, so let's let's talk a bit about toys. Yeah. So do you remember what your first... Um what your first toy was and what got you into collecting. Okay, the, the funny thing is I never had a lot of toys when I was young okay. and I was never really crazy about toys. That's the ir- irony. This sounds, li- <laughs> this sounds like Filipinos, well, not just Filipinos, but people who are of a certain age, like grew up in the 80s and the 90s yeah. and their parents never bought them Jordans yeah. and so now they have tons of Jordans. Yeah. So it was like that for you, but just for toys. In a way, I do remember my brother having his masks, his Transformers and some Star Wars. But um, I wasn't crazy about, about them. I think partly because I think we didn't have the money to buy two sets for yeah, both of us. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I do remember having those toys and I think funnily enough, when I was in my late teens and early 20s, that's when I started picking up I think toys again as you know, Star Wars. It's naturally, I think, what people my age were veer towards too because mm-hmm. that's the stuff that we grew up with. And I remember the very first figure that I had from our childhood was a naked Yoda. A Yoda, oh. Yoda without his, uh, his robe. His robe. Yeah. So it's the, I think it's a one and a half inch or two inch figure. Yeah. So, and then from there, you started picking up more Star Wars? Yes. It was uh, pretty much uh, vintage uh, Star Wars. So there used to be a flea market at uh, Clark Key. Um, when you used to be able to find good stuff, flea markets now are just like rubbish dump for people to dump the stuff that they can't sell on carousel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So those were the days of pre-internet. So there was this uh, fortnightly sort of like magazine come newspaper from the US called Toy Shop. Okay. Yeah. 
So by the time you get it, we'll probably be about a week late, I think, versus those guys in the US. So mm-hmm. we will have to pick up scraps, whatever that we want. We have to fax in our orders. And those were the days before PayPal. Oh, okay. So yeah. you have to do like a wire transfer? And uh, being pretty young that time, wire transfer was such a hassle. So what we did was to send cash. Oh, in envelopes? <laughs> Not in envelopes. We would buy storybooks, put cash oh in the books. God. And then you keep your fingers crossed that they will reach. And then you keep your fingers crossed that the seller is decent enough to send you whatever that you paid for. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So you put cash inside of... You would go buy children's books. Yes, of Put course. cash inside the children's books. In it, in it Blyton. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Hardy boys. <laughs> and then, well, that also made the, the letters more expensive because they, they're heavier. Heavier, but I think at least it's a bit more discreet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so when PayPal and eBay came along, it was just like, oh, wonderful. Things were a lot easier by the time I think PayPal came along. So when did you when did you go from collecting um collecting Star Wars and, and you know mass market toys to collecting more designer limited okay. figures? I think that the problem that I have is I'm never focused. I get distracted very easily. So I've been I was collecting Star Wars for the longest time. And then I think when Michael Lau came along, Frank Kozik, Bear Bricks, and that's when you open up a whole new world where designer toys are I think like a Pandora's box I think and partly being in the creatives I think industry you get inspired and uh, by different designs different looks different cultures yeah so that's when it just went downhill but this is all also quite you know well before the hype because yeah. Michael Lau all those those guys were like early 2000s also in the 90s actually Late that was 90s. when yeah when Kors just started I think releasing his companions as well yeah, so late 90s, early 2000, yeah. Yeah, so pre-hype, like before yeah. what we know today as streetwear, yeah. before what we know today as yeah. as the, the street art movement. N- nobody gave a shit about those toys. I mean, I remember the course companion. There was this shop at uh, Far East Plaza, mm-hmm. Ambush. They mm-hmm. were practically begging, the owner was practically begging people to buy the companions at like 200 sing, 250, yeah. And now, each, oh wow, yeah, now it's like seven thousand, eight thousand dollars. No, nobody wanted them during that time. So, how many did you get? None. <laughs> oh, wait. You didn't want it either. I was like, nah, when nah. did you start picking up a uh, cause then? Hmm, maybe I think with the Chomper Bear Brick was possibly the first piece. I think, mm. yeah, I mean, along the way, I had the chance to pick up the companions at probably, I think, slightly double the original retail price but uh, I was never really crazy about it yeah I don't go around chasing every single colorway trying to complete everything yeah it didn't speak to you I mean his career fascinated me mm. yeah everyone tries to be the next course but there can only be one course yeah yeah from a nobody who really I think just did what he wanted I think I think luck had a lot to play in his career as well. I mean, you can be the most talented artist in the world, but without luck. Yeah. I think luck is one. I think the other thing was just being in Japan. Yeah. Like being in Japan during that era when they were they were building up what we know today as, you know, the streetwear subculture. Yeah. And it was just kind of bubbling up. Yeah, he was in the right place at the right time with the right people. Yeah, that was like the epicenter of I think subculture and street culture during that time. Bounty Hunter was coming up. Yeah, so I think it was just basically hanging around with the right people as well. Yeah, but now we're we're here in your office, and this is kind of a, I I think the kind word is uh, eclectic. <laughs> oh, that's very kind of right because <laughs> there's a huge distribution of of work here. I mean, you have kind of the stuff that you'd expect. Yeah. Right, so you you know we we have Luchu, of course, artists that you work with, um, Quicks, of course, um, and then there's a the hugely popular stuff, Murakami, Cause, of course, uh, and then there's uh, Yoka, a lot of stuff from Secret Fresh, mm-hmm. also, of yep. uh, course, side by side with all the Star Wars stuff. Are you still buying Star Wars stuff? Um, uh, I've actually kind of stopped because the prices have gone through the roof. Mm. It's yeah, too rich for my blood now. There's Breaking Bad. 
you have you have uh over here i'm looking at three of the rocket launcher boba fett <laughs> yep <laughs> when the what what do you call this size this is the um gentle giant jumbo figures it's about 10 12 inches right yeah this were based on the three and three quarter inch so they 3d scanned and then uh upsized it to about oh wow. 12 inches yeah so, so these these boba fett rocket launchers mm. did you get them all at the same time or have you been picking them up this um i think the jumbo ones i yeah just picking them up as i go along and i don't pay over retail for them yeah really so i i think the the fun thing about toy collecting is you just need to be patient yeah i think that's that's a virtue that's lacking in a lot of collectors these days i mean i i'm guilty as charged but i always think that just let the toy come to you if it's meant to be yours it will be yours yeah 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 so um that's a really good tip like patience yeah and waiting for that price to come down because like what do you really want yeah do you want the hype for people to see that this is what you have or do you want to have it yeah i mean right. i don't have deep pockets of course if my father is bill gates or if my best friend is mark Zuckerberg, then of course i I can pay whatever amount that uh, i think i want for a toy but i think the, the key thing is just being patient and uh, getting to know the right people and uh, have fun along the way i always think that it's so sad to see people collecting toys and getting upset over it simply because they cannot catch a drop or they miss out on certain things and they start arguing with fellow collectors it's unnecessary yeah so uh you 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 also do you're into streetwear quite a bit uh yeah being so old i i try to catch up with the trends but I, i'm not totally crazy about <laughs> well yeah. i mean uh, like Chinatown Market seems to be something yeah. that you pick up quite a I bit. I try to stay in touch with the trends that's out there. I think partly because I think in the creative industry, you need to be able to be updated about the trends and yeah, to, to do the stuff that you want, to talk to clients and to en- engage the audience as well. Yeah, I mean, I can't possibly live in a pre-internet era and hoping that, you know, I can survive in this in this world. And yeah. la- last year, you were in a, a localized ad for Night Jogger, weren't you? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no but yeah. the question is like yeah like like when they call you up and they say hey we want you to do this uh this print ad for night jogger as i think as ironic as it sounds i absolutely hate publicity yeah interesting yeah it, it sounds like a paradox sounds like i'm the most hip- hypocritical person on earth but i absolutely prefer to stay just stay in my studio Try not to talk to any human being if possible, but uh, I've also come to a stage where I realized that, you know, I need, yeah, I need to do certain things in order for the brand to be out there, in order for people to know the shit that we are doing. And also to be fair to those working in the agency as well. I mean, I, I would think that there should be the sense of uh, pride and belonging. If we are forever, I think, in the background, nobody knows who we are, then it's, it's really kind of tough. So... Once in a while, when contacted to do certain things, yeah, I'm happy to haul myself if the need arises. <laughs> well, we, we, we are in an era where creative directors really are starting to get the respect that they deserve, yeah. right? Yeah. And like we're starting to see them, you know, um, Kim Jones and Virgil, Virgil Abloh, of yeah. course. Like it's almost impossible to go into any store now and not see the impact that Virgil's made. Yeah, that's, that's what I think. I think. A lot of stuff is actually very personality driven nowadays. Mm-hmm. I mean, certain designs may suck, but you know, simply because it's done by a certain designer, everyone goes gaga over it. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's the world we live in right now, and yeah, it's it's sad, but it's the real world. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I think that's uh, a a big part of that is people being able to relate to those things. Like the designers that are successful are the ones that are able to. Uh, kind of say the thing that everyone's been thinking already, yeah. right? So I was walking on Martin Street yesterday mm. and across from Common Man uh, Coffee Roasters yeah. and then the kind of the delivery bay of Studio M okay. was there. Yeah. And we were just walking and we saw the diagonal stripes of the ramp going up the hill, uh, going up the mm. ramp. Mm. And then there's this big uh, delivery bay loading mm. uh, sign written in Helvetica. Of white. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, Nika, look at this. <laughs> My wife, Nika, I was like, look at this. This is in one shot is understanding what Virgil Abloh <laughs> is doing. Yeah. It's just him making a commentary on what what um, 
working class life is like. Yeah. And it's so ironic because like... But he's a genius. I mean, it's like... It is. We, we see that almost every day, but nobody nobody had the foresight to be able to take that and translate that into, into fashion. Well, yeah. I, I, I might argue that we've seen that a few times with skateboarding companies. Yeah. Uh, but they just use those those great landscapes, you know, those mm. those shots, yeah. to frame the skateboarding. Yeah. And Virgil just took out the skateboarder <laughs> and just put the design. And he put that as a consistent language in whatever shit that he's doing right yes. now. Yeah. So I guess that's where the appeal lies. Do you feel like... So uh, let's bring that back here to Flab Slab. Yeah. Is that... How would you describe the language of Flab Slab? How do people know that this is you? Zero fucks given. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, pardon the word, but um, yeah, it's it's really. I think it's it's tough. I mean, we have been asked to do certain projects. I think which which pay well, but I think we have said no simply because I think we want to do it our way. I mean, mm-hmm. flip on the other side. I think we are already selling our our soul as far as corporate work is concerned. So we are happy doing the corporate work because it pays the bills. So when it comes to projects under Flap Slap, I think we want to have a say in terms of the creative direction, in terms of what we can do and not be told in terms of what we can't do. So I think that's what we stand for and what we believe in and long may it continue. I mean, it's always hard to say no to money. It's so, so hard. But yeah, sometimes you just need to take a step back and um, figure out what you really want in life. Yeah. Well, let's talk a bit about um, controversy. So... I remember <laughs> I, a few months back, you uh, dropped a, a status message on Facebook yeah. about some religious people having issues with some of the work that you'd produced. You remember yep. that? Yep. Can you tell us that story? I think it's you're probably referring to those uh, talisman, talisman flight tags. Yes, the yeah. yellow ones. Yeah, the yellow ones. So that, that was just a random idea that we had internally and then uh, got the girls to put it together in a matter of like an hour. Uh, we posted the design on our... Uh, Instagram and then mothership picked it up. I mean, I was in a meeting and then my phone just went crazy and my friend started messaging me. Do you see? I think mothership shared the thing and then we started having people asking us where to buy the stuff and all this. Yeah, but then of course with every ten supporters, there will always be the naysayer. So there will be people who say, oh, "I'm Taoist. I find this super offensive that you guys are going to hell. I think your shop is <laughs> going to close down soon." Yeah, it's, literally, we have people saying that. Yeah, but. I mean, at least from our point of view, it wasn't meant to, I think, ridicule any religion because talisman are seen out vampires, Chinese movies. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we were just making a statement that you could use those to what off idiots and stupid people. What did the talisman say? Because it was written in, in were, Chinese. Yeah, three different ones. I think one, if I may say, says no worries. motherfucker. <laughs> one okay. says son of a turtle and another one just say fuck you. If I'm son of a turtle. Yeah. Okay. Is that a is that a, a insult here? Yeah, it's a literal translation, but uh, it actually means son of a turtle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it was it was fun. I think looking at the reactions and uh, I think comments. But yeah, to me, life is too short. I think instead of getting upset over things that you see online, maybe take a step back, go for a jog. It's like, yeah, life is too hard. Why make it more difficult? Is that the first time you face something like that? No, I think maybe because of the stuff that we do, we. I always think that, I think being in boring Singapore, in the commas, I think the the last thing that we should be doing is just stick to status quo. So we always try to push the envelope in terms of the stuff that we do. I always say, be brave, but don't be stupid. Yeah, I mean, there are lines that we shouldn't cross. Absolutely. And we know that. The last thing I want to do is to have to go to Cantonment, talk to the police, and then, uh, yeah, and I'm not seeing my family for a while. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, we have also done quite a few pieces related to the late Lee Kuan Yew. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that was done way before he passed away. Yeah. and In support or? I wouldn't say it's in support. I mean, I'm ambivalent towards that guy. Interesting. He, he's a fucking asshole. I agree. <laughs> but then... It was necessary during that time. I, I always describe him as uh, like like he's the case for the democratic uh, dictator. Like yep. you know what I mean? Like he behaved in a way that that really, if you if you yep. put it up against a human rights ruler, yeah, it you know it it wouldn't it wouldn't fare well. Yeah, but people just kept on voting for him. Yeah, 
but then again, the irony is a lot of Singaporeans condemn him, but then when you go overseas, people wish that they have him. This is true. Yeah. So the grass is always greener on the other side. So to me, I think we did that sculpture called Papa Mm -hmm. because he's seen as the founding father of modern Singapore. But it's also, I think, a commentary about relationship that you have with your own father. You know, as much as sometimes you hate your father, you know, if you take a step back, the advice or the words that they he he tells you would actually make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that kind of, I think, paradoxical relationship. So we did a piece about him, I think, maybe about eight, seven, eight years ago. So somehow the media picked it up and I started having messages and calls from my friend again saying, no, you're going to jail. <laughs> Good luck to you. I will take care of your toys when you're away. But, I mean, deep down inside, I knew that nothing is going to happen. Simply because, I mean, I wasn't being rude about him. I was just making a statement. And if really somebody was to come after me, I think they would just be proving the conspiracy theories. Right. Does yeah. that stuff still happen in, in Singapore these days? I wouldn't, I wouldn't know, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are things happening that I wouldn't know, but... Um, they I, don't make the news. They don't make the news, but I, I also know that nothing, touch wood, nothing has happened to me because, I mean, as far as corporate work is concerned, we are still doing work for certain government ministries as well. I yeah. see. And my clients are quite aware of the stuff that I do. I always think, yeah, just, just don't be stupid. Yeah. Yeah, I actually think that you know, there are ways that the government are kind of um, uh, behind mm-hmm. here, but there are ways that they're very progressive as well. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I was uh, with uh, Slack over at Black Book oh. yesterday, and we were talking about like how nobody wants to paint in the skate park anymore because <laughs> they make you fill out forms. And it's like, oh, dude, we've been painting here for 10 years. Like, you don't know who we are. Uh, Maybe it's new management. <laughs> no, but that, that's one of the things that they change the management every one year yeah. maybe so they've been there 10 years 10 different managements um uh, and that's one of the ways that maybe singapore could grow yeah. or um and you know i was i i spent several years growing up here mm. and one of my neighbors very nearby here was michael fay <laughs> our dear michael fay <laughs> our dear michael fay and um you know if if michael fay had not done what he did mm. it would you know that vandalism graffiti would have been you know just a nuisance just yep. like a little petty crime or not even a crime it would have been uh you know just kids being kids right yep. like just like skateboarding or something <laughs> uh but because of the impact of what he did and like how crazy you know the level that he took it to and yep. he described he destroyed uh, public property yeah uh, actually private property he would. I, I'd be go in the school Class, bus, and yeah. I'd see. Yeah, he he'd be spray painting on cars, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't even nice. <laughs> it wasn't even nice spray paint. Um, but yeah, because of that, it became an anti-vandalism act. Yeah, and it, it's had you know severe impact, I think, on the culture here. But but then the problem is that's not how a lot of people overseas actually see this as well. They just mm-hmm. see the government as being barbaric and all this. But yeah, I mean, there's always two sides to a story. <laughs> that that's true. Yeah. But I was also here the day that they banned bubblegum. Oh. And that was pure barbary. <laughs> <laughs> Something's got to give. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh so for, for those who don't know, uh do you remember the story about bubblegum? The bubblegum? Which one? Somebody threw into the onto the train tracks. Yeah, someone threw a gum into the train door. Yeah. And I remember this train that's r- right outside your window was stopped in the middle of the of the tracks yeah. and it was there for like a couple hours. So the next day they found that the reason why is because all the trains had to stop because <laughs> automatic stop system said, okay, one train is not closing, so we have to stop all the trains so that no trains run into each other. <laughs> and they found is one piece of gum. And then the next day they were like, we are gonna ban right. all bubble gum. And that's why they always say Singaporeans don't deserve good things. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are some really nice things here. Uh, okay, I have, a, I have a question about uh, toy production. Sure. Because we were talking earlier about uh, 3D printing. Yeah. And uh, we've had, we've had uh, what do you call that, PLA-based mm. 3D printing in our studio for a while now. Yeah. Uh, and we've, we've produced uh, 
limited run toys for mm. them. But just last week, a resin printer showed up in our lab. Wow. <laughs> so uh, it, the it's an Elegoo, right? Mm. Uh, resin printer. And it's quite affordable, right? The prices have come down tremendously. Yeah, yeah. it's about five, 500 US dollars, more or less, which puts it in the range of, you know, DJ equipment or a drone or an SLR. Yeah. Do you see where I'm going with yeah. this? <laughs> SLRs became uh, affordable, kind of in that price range. Yeah. Now everybody's a photographer. Yes. Right? Uh, so everyone can be a toy designer now. <laughs> and that's my, that's kind of my, where I'm going with this. Yeah. What do you think the effect's going to be? And is that a positive thing or is it maybe not so good? I mean, technology has definitely made our lives a lot easier. But um, I think for the longest time when I started making toys, I resisted the use of uh, 3D printing. So I still prefer working with sculptors, seeing things uh, from a lump of clay into a 3D sculpt. But um, I think maybe because of my age, that's why I res- resist technology. But um, I think for the past couple of years, I've come to realize that in order to get things done faster, it's something that we can't avoid. So we are still doing things traditionally, but um, I think maybe half or even more of the stuff right now are being 3D sculpted and 3D printed. So with technology, everyone can claim to be an expert. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's back to what we discussed. I always think making is the easy part. It's the selling, finding an audience, finding a voice that is so, so tough. Yeah. So maybe we're in an age where many people can prototype, right? And then see what sticks. Yeah, I, I think the girls in the studio, I think went for ZBrush uh, classes. After a couple of uh, classes, they started sculpting their own toys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we don't have a printer in-house, but we could send it to any someone to get it printed. So I think it's definitely made things a lot easier. And um, I think open up avenues for people with different skill sets. Yeah, but then again, back to the idea of after you make the toy, what do you want to do with it? Yeah, yeah. I would say that that's uh, if if I was a collector on the level that you were, because I I do, I do collect a bit. <laughs> well, um, would it don't doesn't it excite you the idea that there would be all these ideas out there that maybe we never would have been able to see? But I think the the scary thing is also there's just too much shit out there right now. Yeah, whether it's good or bad, there's just so many things that you can't possibly finish looking at finish uh, seeing so th- there have been times where I try to stay away from Instagram just so because there are so many things to look at but it also means that you know you see a disparity in terms of quality of work in terms of production quality as well so I mean granted that it's so cheap everyone who is interested should take a step but I think it also I think cultivates the mindset that things are easy which is absolutely not because social media makes everything look easy. You know, you see a 3D post of a 3D sculpt, the next thing, the production toy is here and then you see it selling out. You know, everyone thinks that, oh, I can be a toy designer, but there are so many different factors that go into it. Yeah. How do you guys know? How do you guys know which toys to produce, which artists to work I, with? I still don't know. <laughs> I do everything based on my gut feeling. So I think, of course, we try not to be stupid. So it's always based on the basis that whatever toy that we produce, can we sell enough to cover our costs so that whatever money that we cover back can go towards producing, I think, the next toy and the next toy after that. So it's a bit of a foolhardy mentality where, you know, we don't aim for big profits or whatever, but I think that's how we have been the past few years and I think that's how I see ourselves, I think, doing the next couple of years. So do you think that this will ever I'm, be massive? I'm. Yeah. The problem with a model like this is very hard to scale up. But then again, if I consider this as a passion project, still as a hobby, then... I think this is something that we would want to stick to where I think we want to hold on to our beliefs and only doing the things that we feel that we will pay money ourselves. Yeah. And what's in the future then? Like, if you're saying just the next couple of years, what's after that? Like, <laughs> the problem with me is I don't plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems I've uh, done well so far. With, 
I go with the flow and uh, really I think living each day the best that I can because I think life is too short. I am going to be 50 in a couple of years time. I've already seen guys my age dropping like flies or guys even earlier. So we can talk about five year plan, 10 year plan, but you can plan all you want. But you know, if it's your time to go, then really those those plans don't come into play anymore. So really, I think do the best that we can. Be a decent human being. I think uh, be happy and have fun and work with the people that you like and that you love. It actually makes sense that you don't have that much of a plan. <laughs> Float like a butterfly. It's it's kind of embarrassing because yeah, that's even with the agency that I run, we have never really had like a long term plan. I think we just want to do every single piece of work the best that we can, and then uh, let our work speak for itself. Which is also the reason why we are. It's kind of ironic. We are a creative agency, but we're so bad at marketing ourselves. We don't have a portfolio online. Our website says shit about us. So it's just, yeah, that's how we roll. You're describing 70% of creative agencies. No, a lot of creative agencies have a long list of their clientele, you know, talk about strategy and all this. But yeah, I think clients come to you because they want you to solve their problems. But agency websites are never as good as the client work. That's true. It's kind of an irony. Yeah. (laughs) So strange, right? (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think that comes down to uh, maybe self-awareness and... Yeah, you always blame me on time, you know. We just don't have time to work on our own stuff. <laughs> Do you have a favorite toy? The stuff that I make or my own toy? Let's start with stuff that you make. Yeah. I think it's like asking who is my favorite son. <laughs> it's, you it's don't really, have an answer for that? I, I really don't have an answer. I mean, it's like, I like every everything that we do. I mean, even things that sell out, things that we still have stock. But I think we just like every single thing that we do. I mean, yeah. yeah. I think not not to beat our own chest, but uh, we are we just have fun, yeah. How about stuff that you've bought? Maybe a couple of the original vintage uh, Star Wars uh, pieces. It's still Star Wars. Yeah. After but, uh, all of this, after. But uh, but then again, I always joke that oh, it's it's true that I'm never going to leave anything for my kids. So one day, if somebody walks past the studio, knocks on my door, I say, "Look, I've heard about you. I'm in the midst." of looking to buy an entire collection, would you consider selling? So if he offers me an obscene amount, I would sell everything lock, stock, barrel, including the studio and walk away. Yeah. And then what? Yeah. Start shopping again? Start shopping, maybe keep the money in the bank for the kids. Yeah. Because the I can't take anything when I when I'm gone. This is true. Yeah. I can't take anything. I don't want to take anything. And the thrill is really in the hunt. But more importantly, meeting people. I mean, without me doing this, I wouldn't have met you. Yeah, I would yeah, have met many, many, many other people. And plus the fact that I don't travel, or I hardly <laughs> travel. So doing the shit that I'm doing has allowed me to really, I think, meet different people from all walks of life. And for that, I'm, I'm very grateful. So toys are, I think, fine and dandy, but yeah. The kind of zen. I mean, I'm an atheist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I believe that all religions will teach you to be good, but yeah, I just be- believe in being a decent human being. So I'm kind of zen in my thinking that, yeah, they are worldly possessions. I mean, sounds kind of snobbish because people say, oh, yeah, of course you have already have so many toys, you can say that. But that, that's that's not the whole point. Yeah. So, I mean, I buy the pieces without the view of selling them, but I've sold pieces just so that I can help friends to fill gaps in their collection. Or maybe when I don't feel for them anymore, someone wants to buy, yeah, I'll, I'll sell them. Is it more about having them or hunting them? I mean, that's a good question. I think it's really the hunt. The fun is really in the hunt. Because once you get it, you put it on the shelf and you go on your next hunt. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a journey. It's really the journey. That's why I always tell people don't go crazy because if you jump in too fast, spend too much money, you will definitely burn out. And Mm -hmm. I've seen so many people burning out over the years. And then they sell their collection, walk away. <laughs> Either they sell the collection and then uh yeah, just move on to something else or they basically cause the market to crash. Yeah, I th- I think that it's a the the no plan thing actually fits in really well with your brand. Like it, it is self awareness to know that from day one it was always float like a butterfly, right? That yeah. butterfly effect of like uh living and creating chaos, right? And um, 
yeah, just basically going where I think life leads you and really, I think the world is in a chaos right now. I think you can make maybe, I think, plans one, two, five years ahead, but you just don't even know what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, there are so many things that we, we have planned for this year, but with the factories closed, things being delayed and all this, yeah, sh- shit goes up in the air. Oh, Yeah, because of COVID, right? COVID. <laughs> uh, how about this? What should people look forward to this year? From us? Or? Yeah, from you. I don't know, just basically more of the same. Creating shit and uh, hopefully working with uh, people that we like and um, having fun with us. Come along for the ride. Yeah, <laughs> continued. I, I don't know if you ever uh, realized, but float like a butterfly, sing like a bee is uh, very much a poly- pollinization, cross-pollinization process as well. So it's the, it, there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of the interesting things that you bring to other, pro- you know, to new projects. Yeah come from old projects as well. Yeah, which is which is something we truly enjoy because I think we, while we make toys, we don't just want to stick in this vertical because we have always enjoyed collaborating with people across different industries. Yeah, and I think this is what the creative world is all about. Yeah, you shouldn't pigeonhole yourself simply because you're a toy designer. So you yeah. can be collaborating with a fashion designer, even with an architect. Yeah, so just look out for opportunities and all, all the possibilities out there. Amazing. All right. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Oh, sorry. We're not supposed to shake hands. It's okay. Ah. We're all dying anyway. (laughs) 